Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, we have a very exciting panel lined up today, breaking through indie filmmaking in South Asia. Um, the panel, uh, I encourage everyone in the audience to ask questions throughout the panel. There's a button at the bottom of your screen uh, that says um, Q&A. We will have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the panel to take audience questions. Uh, once you enter a question, make sure um, that you uh, also have the availability to upvote a question, and I will be selecting a few questions at the end. Uh, there is a way to anonymously ask a question as well, so if you feel like you don't want to reveal who you are and uh, want to ask a question, you can always anonymously ask a question. Um, I'm very happy to introduce this panel. I've um, had the pleasure of knowing some of these filmmakers for just over a decade, and it's uh, my pleasure to start uh, with the first introduction. Um, I have Apia Nathaniel, who's a Pakistani filmmaker living in New York. I had the opportunity to co-produce Apia's directorial debut, Dukhtar. I have Deepak Raniar, who is a Nepali filmmaker living in New York. Um, Deepak has directed two feature films and is getting ready to do his third one. We have Gitu Mohandas, who is a actress and a director from India. And Geetu has directed two feature films as well. Um, and then I have Mustafa Sarwar Faruqi, uh, who is a writer director from Bangladesh um, based in Dhaka. And I've had the pleasure of producing Faruqi's latest feature film, No Land's Man, starring Nawazuddin Siddiqui. And finally, we have Tashi Gelsen, uh, who is a writer director from Bhutan. Um, Welcome everyone. Um, we're very excited to have you. Um, before we start the panel, I just wanna give a, a, a big shout out to the team at Dharamshala International Film Festival for turning the festival into an online edition given the challenging times that we currently are in. Um, we really appreciate your support to the indie filmmaking community in South Asia and also making this panel and a lot of these panels available worldwide uh, to worldwide audiences. So I want to start with a, a first uh, prompt question. Uh, feel free to jump in. And my question is going to be, what was one piece of advice you wish you had received when you decided to be a filmmaker? Not when you made your first film or get, were getting ready to be a filmmaker. Well, so what was that first piece of advice you wish like you had received when you decided you wanted to be a filmmaker, be it at any age, whenever you said, hey, I want to make movies, what was what, what would that be? I, I can go first. Yeah. So I wish someone had told me that in order to be a creative spirit in this industry, you also have to understand the business side in a pretty deep way, especially if you want to be making films for global audiences. So you know, the creative side is not going to exist in an, in an empty vacuum. So I wish somebody had like, you know, shook me with that advice before. <laughs> For me, like, uh, I didn't know anything. Like I didn't go to film school. I had no background. I only had anger and I wanted to share my story. So there was nothing I, I knew. Like, so any piece of advice could have been really helpful. Um, uh, Gitu or Faruqi? Well, um, I remember the advice which was given and, and I completely love it. And that's um, from my, my partner, my husband, Rajiv Ravi, he's also a filmmaker and cinematographer. And he said, um, just go and do your film. Don't, um, don't work with anyone, don't assist anyone. Just, just go and shoot your film. And I think that's the best advice <laughs> that, that I received. And I've been, um, I've been telling everybody that, you know, people who come up to me and says, you know, can I assist you? I said, I just go, just go do your film, just go do your film. That's something which I keep saying. So, yeah. Um, Faruqi and Tashi, do you guys wish, like you had told your younger selves something? Um, as Faruqi, especially since you have made the most number of films amongst this group, uh, like what would you have told your teen teenager self or whenever you decided to be a filmmaker? I think my case is uh, pretty similar to Deepak actually. Mm -hmm. um, 
I had no prior experience. I never assisted anyone. I never went to film school. I had no idea. I just jumped into water. And I knew one thing that I had to survive or I'll die. So obviously for me as well, any piece of advice would, would have been welcome. I mean, you know, as you know that, you know, in this filmmaking world, you need actually at least 130 advices every day. <laughs> so for me, any advice would, would be welcome. Um, me too. Actually, I uh, never took that plunge uh, knowingly that I'm going to be a filmmaker. And uh, I, by the time I realized I was a filmmaker and uh, I was trying to find a credible thing to say, but somehow I, I, I couldn't because I, I didn't know what I was doing. Then by the time I realized I was in the, in the film industry and I also didn't go to film school and uh, I had to learn everything. But I wish I had a mentor or somebody who actually was there to tell me, but unfortunately there was no one, so. <laughs> yeah. I think, I mean, one of the things that Deepak, uh, you mentioned was you were angry, right? So, and you, and you wanted to tell people why you were angry and tell the stories that you wanted to say. So what are, can you talk a little bit more about how you translated that primal emotion into, on, into your own work and into the, the films that you are, are making? Um, so... I was. I grew up in a society that uh, I was. I was born into a dictatorship. Then we had a war, and we had a revolution. Society went through the several things, but our cinema was not reflecting any of any of that. Like on the screen, I come from a society, uh, background of dark skin. Madhesh is in Nepal, which is about thirty to thirty-three percent of population, but our cinema was portraying us in a way they would blackface themselves to play us in the Senate film. And those other things were really like, uh, I didn't find representation there. I didn't find my stories being told. I didn't find what was happening around being conveyed in the film. So I really like <clears throat> wanted to be a filmmaker, wanted to share my side of the story. But I, at that time, there was no way to become, like go to film school. I could not afford abroad. And locally, there was no film school, literally. So for me, it was to, to join journalism, mm -hmm. start making connection, start learning, um, writing. And then I joined a director called Srinita Sherpa. Uh, and working with him became a graduation for me. Working with him became a school for me. And then I joined um, BBC, came to Nepal, BBC. Uh, World Service Trust, and I worked for them for three and a half years, writing and producing dramas, and that trained me to bring stories. So once I started to decided like now it's time that we start making films, uh, everything like until now has been like, uh, whatever I was impacted in my life, I was trying to portray in some way, bring some way into the story, like my first film, deals in the background of like we had a bomb culture was happening like you block the road to demand anything so my first film is a bus journey from eastern part of the country to the capital in the backdrop of that where i talk you know, explore racism and current political scenario that uh, was happening at that time in nepal my first shot is about encounter between two two women uh, one woman is inspired by my uh, brother-in-law brother's wife. So those are the things I was trying to deal like, like last film, the White Sun is uh, set in the backdrop of the civil war that we had. And I was trying to portray, convey like our uh, country after 2012, uh, like war ended in 2006, but uh, soon country adopted a narrative saying like war was no, u no use. And it happened like it, it only brought bad and we start talking about like why the war happened at, at first mm -hmm. place and what was the core problem of the society that war had to happen. So, uh, so we wanted to, with that film to explore like the reasoning of the war happened and what if the silver lining was there anything or like how war changed the society in the true meaning. So those are the things like what I felt was trying to translate into cinema. My next film is set in the, 
a southern plains in Nepal, coming from my community that I was grown up and where the, uh, after the war for first time dark skin diseases were came to this speed in thousands in number and but they have been killed more than 100 and and that had been a violent protest but haven't been dealt so my mm-hmm. next film is the backdrop of that protest exploring it's a police thriller but i'm exploring racism nationality and its gender and the setting of that I think so. I mean, that's a very interesting point. I mean, having seen uh, your films, all of you guys, there is uh, an idea of racism within South Asia, and it's in, it's explored in in your films. So, in in sort of your daily life, in your filmmaking life, have you experienced personally any any kind of racism within your community um, because you belong to a certain uh, caste or you belong to a certain class uh, or because of your skin color. And and I think that's, it's a thing that's happening around the world right now is these heightened tensions. So as you were setting up your first films, this is specifically about your first film. So in, in some of your cases, it is 10 years ago or seven years ago, or like three, four years ago, what, what were the roadblocks? What was the, the no that you constantly heard as you were getting ready to do your first feature film? Can I go? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, I have you. So I'm from Pakistan and uh, originally from there now in, in New York. And I think for me, the biggest roadblock in in Pakistan is we don't really have a thriving industry, a film industry, unlike India or, you know, Bollywood right next door. Um, So in terms of racism, I would say in our society, it it operates on two different levels. One is one has to do more with sexism and like gender politics. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I see Geetu shaking her head, we'll get to that. But the other one, more importantly, I think that we in South Asia deal with is the socioeconomic divide within within the indie world as well. Uh, at least in Pakistan, there's a big divide between uh, independent filmmakers that come from very elite, rich backgrounds versus myself, who are you know from middle class, lower middle class, self-taught, you know, kind of rose on their own merit through whatever way. So for us to step into the industry with our first feature films, it was extremely hard to break into the boys club, which was mostly elite. Um, And so you're fighting the battle on two different fronts. You know, you're first of all, not being taken seriously because you're a female director, but secondly, you're not in the in circle of the indie world and the elite segment. So that's what I felt was a really big um, roadblock. Uh, and I'm curious to hear how it probably evolved for other, mm-hmm. other filmmakers on this panel, but that was for me the biggest one to deal with. So I think th- that's a good point that Afia brings in, in terms of sexism. I think if Gitu, if you can talk a little bit about sort of your journey, you were already um, an established actress before you made your first feature as a director. So can you talk a little bit about the the challenges you faced in terms of expanding your cinematic career from being an actress to being an actress, writer, director. Um, And maybe also talk a little bit about not just the roadblock, but the first chance someone took on you as a writer, director. And they said, I believe in this person. And what did that make you feel? And how did that support the journey of your film moving forward? So it's a multi-layered question. I think if you can if you can talk to that, that'd be great. No, for me, I think I became an actor by default, uh, to be very honest. Um, I was terrible at what I did. <laughs> so, um, so what happened was I was a child artist and there was a really beautiful, um, and I think it's one of my favorite films uh, in Malayalam. Uh, it's called Onnumundal Poojimbare. It's one of the cult classics in Malayalam. And I was part of it as a child artist and that became very popular. So I became very popular and that just kind of went on for four or five films. And then I took off abroad. I was studying abroad. Then when I came back, they introduced me as a lead actor and that kind of just 
it just continued. It was not something that my heart was in place or something, but I was just kind of seeing, okay, you know, this is my thing, but I was writing and I was doing a lot of other things. So at, at one point, I think the last movie I did was with uh, Adur Gobalakrishnan called Four Women. And I was one among the women. And then I said, okay, this is it. You know what, it's going to be a closure to acting. Now let me get into um, writing and directing. And that's how I made the switch. And then I thought it's easy. You know, I know, I know people, I can, you know, meet them. I can get contacts, this and that. It took me seven years to get uh, financing for Liar's Dice because I thought that when I'm writing something, I need to be really, really honest with what, how, you know, what my expression is and, you know, how I want to tell a story. And I realized that while writing it, it's, um, there is an element in it, in Liar's Dice, which is very mundane, which is very uh, repetitive. And it was done on purpose because I did the entire travel. It's a travel journey about um, a woman, a child, a la lamb on a mountain, and there's a man who comes in between. And when I did the exact travel, nothing happened in my journey. So I wanted to be honest with my writing. And I said, nothing should happen because nothing happened in my journey. And it was just a long, prolonged journey. But there were a lot of several undercurrents which uh, kept coming in, you know, with the landscape and mm. with the dynamics between relationships. And people just wouldn't get it because it would be easy for me to meet people. But A, they wouldn't take me seriously. Um, you know, they would say that, okay, actor mm, wanting to make a film, a woman, a lamb on a mountain, how are we going to sell? <laughs> So this is something which I constantly faced for seven years. And it's amazing how the job pictures who supported me, my friends who came in as a line production um, at first, end of the seven years, they were like, you know what, can we just produce your movie? And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that happened. And they became producers with the film and it, it did well. And the moment it was the nation's entry for the Oscars, boom, the same people who wanted nothing to do with it, you know, you know, they wanted to jump on the bandwagon and take the film forward. And that's when I said, no, you know what? It's a small film. It's going to be this producers and we're going to, you know, go the whole mile. So I, I saw the switch changing and then I saw mm. a, a different change when um, my second film, Muton, it premiered in TIFF and then it, it was the opening film in Mami. And then that kind of, um, you know, kind of opened more doors for me. I feel I'm taken more seriously now, you know, and, and, and I bet, and I, and I don't know why my journey took so long um, to be in a position that I am, I'm in right now where I can choose, you know, okay, this is the type of film I want to say and this is how I want to tell it. But somewhere down the line, I think, um, it's going to be a constant struggle. Like, I don't think it's just about this one film. It, I think it's going to be a constant struggle for me to find financing for my films because the type of films that I want to tell, um, I, I don't think uh, it's, it's for the B and the C and the, the mass and, you know, it's an expression. So it's going to be a constant struggle. I mean, apart from so many other layers that uh, <laughs> we need to hit being a woman filmmaker, right. and, yeah. So, Geetu, you mentioned that your first film, Liars Dice, took you about seven years to make. Uh, if I can have everyone on the panel talk, just give the year figure of how long it took you to make your first film, meaning from the moment you had the idea till the world premiere of your film. Just so we, our audience gets an idea of how long it might take for a, for a first feature film to come together. But a first feature uh, film, Liars Dice, was shot in 22 days, I must say, even though it took seven years for financing, right. we did the shooting in 22 days. Right. So. That's the story of independent film, right? The, shoot, yeah. the shooting portion is the shortest portion and that your before and after takes years. Sometimes even the after takes years because you might still be raising money to finish your film. Um, Afia, if you can speak to a little bit, just so that everyone in the audience knows, Afia and Gitu had their respective films be their country's official entries for the Oscars in the same year, uh, which is very rare for South Asia to have two female filmmakers uh, be representing the country. So Afia, if you can talk a little bit about how long it took you to get Bukhtar together, uh, that'd be great. So just echoing Geetu's uh, sentiments here, it's, it's a really long journey, it's damn hard, but you know, you kind of stick to it once you believe in something, right? So for me, it was 10 years. And uh, like Geetu, I had a line producer who had been with me for many, many years. And you know, he saw me struggle uh, through all this process. And in the end, he said, Afia Ji, just pack your bags and come to Pakistan and we'll make this film. So. You know, by that time, I had just managed to raise 
uh, the first uh, 100,000 euros through a, a Norwegian co-producer. We won that uh, grant, a Norwegian grant. And that is all we needed after all these years, you know, trying to find a million dollars or even 500,000 and even like the lowest figure, it came down to this grant that enabled us um, to really go into the mountains. You know, it's a road trip film. So my first feature, Dukhtar, it's a road trip film. It's about a mother uh, who kidnaps her 10 year old daughter and makes a run from her village in the north of Pakistan. And the hardest sell about this film had been the fact that it was a story of a female heroine and her child. So in, in Pakistan, it's a very unusual uh, combination because you're expecting a male hero who's macho, who's kind of like, you know, he's gonna have a female heroine who's gonna come in and do a bit of an item number and then, you know, flash her boobs and revealing clothes and whatever. Like that was not gonna be this film. So fighting for the authenticity of a story that was grounded in realism. That's what it took so, you know, that's why it took so long. And, and all it took, you know, in terms of being hopeful, uh, it was that one line producer, a local uh, relationship, he came on board as a main producer and brought the wealth of his experience and knowledge. And we said, all right, we're first time. All of us were first time. Uh, filmmakers and crew members on a feature film. So my producer was a first time producer. I was a first time director. My DP was a first time DP. My production designer was a first time production designer on this feature film. But together um, for the cast and crew, this was gonna be a journey that would define us and take us further in our own way. So there was a lot of passion. So I just wanna lift that up uh, and, and bring it, you know, there's going to be roadblocks, there's going to be challenges, but really, you know, as, in terms of believing it and, and, and hustling and, and pulling that team together, that's, that's also part of the job, you know, finding the right people to work with and, and then going with that passion. So 10 right. years. <laughs> 10 years. Tashi. <laughs> yeah, Tashi. So you've done one, one feature film, The Red Palace. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how long it, it took you to make it? And also, I would like to add an, another layer uh, to your question. Uh, because India overshadows all the neighboring uh, South Asian countries substantially in, in, in the entertainment industry, can you talk a little bit about maintaining your film's Bhutanese identity as you were developing the project? But also beyond that, what were specific roadblocks you faced when you were putting the project together? And did you find any collaborators from other South Asian countries to kind of help you get your project together? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, in Bhutan until the first, uh, the Bhutanese film industry started in, uh, in 1998, the first feature film. So before that, uh, there was only Bollywood and uh, for, for Bhutanese, uh, when we talk about a film, film means Bollywood. So the uh, independent films uh, did not exist. Uh, so it was, uh, it was very difficult to, 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 uh, to make something different in terms of, again, uh, Bhutan being a, a very uh, small country, uh, being very protective about its culture, its tradition, being, I mean, in between China and India. So with that kind of uh, perspective, uh, Bhutan was quite uh, hostile to change. So when you come as an independent filmmaker, filmmaker to do, uh, when you want to do something different, so it was, uh, it was very difficult, uh, not only from the perspective of the, the policies and the, the audience or the, the acceptance of the film or the narrative, the story, um, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, like, for example, I, my, uh, I took almost uh, four, five, six, almost six years to finish my first film. And, uh, and then I ran into a, a, a censorship problem here in Bhutan and uh, I couldn't show my film here because uh, a lot of the, almost uh, 11 to 12 minutes were cut. And, uh, the sort of uh, the authorities the, 
think that uh, when you are trying to do something different, they are very suspicious of what you do. And they always uh, have that uh, very narrow perspective. And since they have the power, then, then you are, it's very difficult for you to, to maneuver or move around. So uh, it, it, it's, a, it's not an easy uh, thing to do to make an independent film in, in, in places like, uh, like in, in Bhutan, especially. And on top of that, we don't have uh, uh, almost uh, non-existent of uh, the, the, the uh, funding agency. And uh, uh, luckily, fortunately, I met uh, uh, a, uh, a producer from Nepal, Ram Krishna Pokharil. And I met a producer from uh, Germany who, who invested in my first film. And uh, fortunately, I got to make my first film because of, again, uh, co-production of uh, the producers that I met during the Open Doors in Switzerland. Great. So I think I, I think that's a it's a good point that you pick up uh, bring. So Deepak and and Faruqi, both of you have done films that have been international co-productions. Uh, not necessarily just your first film, but maybe uh, Faruqi, you can talk a little bit about how how you've approached collaboration uh, with South, how South Asian counterparts, but also collaboration and co-production with Europe, just to. Um, Give you just to give you a prompt. No bed of roses starred um, Irfan Khan, and it was uh, he was also, I guess, one of the producers on the on the film with you. So how did that come about? And in Saturday afternoon, you have a German co-producer, um, and then in your latest film, you again have an Indian actor Nawazuddin Siddiqui in the film. So can you talk a little bit about as you're developing your material? how do you look for and go about finding um, the right partners in order to get your film forward? And also answer the first question, uh, how long did it take you to make your first film? Yeah, I think, you know, I was, I was attentively listening to everyone and I was feeling like, you know, we all have the same story. I mean, it's, it's nothing different. Mm. Well, yeah, for me, I mean, it might sound funny, but I have something in common with Deepak here as well. Like the first thing I had, the first problem I had as a human being was my identity crisis. Identity crisis as in, I come from a district in Bangladesh which is called Nuakhali, which is generally hated. So what happened is in my early childhood, even in my school, I would never tell that I'm from Nuakhali. And I would never bring my classmates, even if when my schoolmates used to come to my house, I would make sure that my dad doesn't come in front of them because if he comes in front of them, uh, if you start speaking, they'll understand from the accent. So you see, it's a, it's, a, it's a serious identity crisis and identity suppression I had to go through. And I feel like, now I'm looking, but I feel like, you know, Nolan's man has, you know, some sort of reflection of that suppression that I, I had gone through. And then when I, at one point, when I thought that, okay, uh, I tried many things. I tried to li write poetry. I tried to uh, be a journalist li like Deepak. So I tried many things. Actually, I, I wanted to become a journalist just to know people. Because I come from, as I said, first from Nuakhali, second from Nakhalpara, which is a lower middle class, middle class area. So as Afi was saying, I don't belong to the elite class. So how to mix with this art and culture people? How to, how to get to them? So I thought, oh, journalism could be a way. I mean, if I can be a journalist, uh, then people will take me seriously. They'll, they'll allow me, they'll give me some time. I can talk to them. And, and so journalism for me was an excuse. And through that excuse, I met Tarek Masood. And that was the best relation uh, of my life, I would say. Tarek Masood was a Bangladeshi filmmaker. We all know that he made one film, which is called Clay Bard, which was in Director's Fortnight in 2002. So then... I, I was maintaining a kind of sort of relationship with Tarak Bhai. At the same time, I was thinking, well, how can I make film? Because at the time when I was thinking of making a film, so it took 10 years for me to shoot my first film. So when I started to think, okay, I'll make a film. At the time, it was impossible to make a film outside our, our mainstream film industry, right? And it was impossible to make the kind of film I want to make. Um, so I didn't know how to do it. Thankfully, at the time, I got, uh, you know, 
I got connected with a local terrestrial television. And through that television, I started to make telefictions like telefilms and blah, blah, blah. And through those telefilms, I, I started to generate some sort of audience. And that audience actually, you know, helped me uh, to, you know, nab my first financier or first producer because through because that producer found it all. A lot of young people follow this guy. So maybe we can invest some money and maybe half of the money will go into water, half of the money might come back. So that's how he came on board. But when I was when I was telling my story, I had one problem and one virtue. So my problem was my virtue. My problem was my ignorance and I found that th that was kind of virtue as well. Um, now looking back, I, I feel like when I started making films or telefilms, whatever, I didn't know how to shoot a scene. I didn't know how to communicate with the actor. I didn't know how to tell them what I want. So for me, it was actually a boon. Boon as in, uh, if you look back, you know, generally Bangladeshi cinema, no matter whether it's an art, art house film or mainstream film is mostly you know copycat of indian cinema either bollywood or kolkata art house so you know what happens is our heroes they 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 talk to uh, their lovers the way uh, kolkata people talk i mean it's, it's not the language that we talk but we have been using it in our films for many years um not only not only the language but also you know you know people are different like like tamil people their body language and um, Kashmiri people, their body language is completely different. The way they react, like the way a French guy would react to a situation and the, the way a Bangladeshi guy would react to a situation is completely different. In our film, what would happen that the way Kolkata people react or the way uh, those Bollywood stars react, our actors would react the same way because that's the way they know. That's the way they take pause. So everything is, you know, metered like that way. But since I didn't know about anything, I didn't know how to tell them. So what happened is I, I, could, I started telling them what I saw in my real life. So I started telling them, oh, you do it this way. And that whatever I used to show them, that would never match with the typical acting pattern. So what happened is I got huge audience from the young uh, people. At the same time, I started to face resistance from the industry, from intelligentsia. So one group was attacking me saying, this guy is destroying our language. Another group was destroying saying, this guy is, this guy is destroying acting because they, that's, the, that's not the way they are used to see acting. They feel like our oh, acting should be like the way Kolkata superstars or Bollywood superstars do. It should not be the way we do it in our real life. Why would acting be like that? So they started you know, bashing me heavily in press, in television, and at that moment, one man actually stood beside me, who is Tarek Masood. He wrote a uh, long article on Bangladesh's top news daily, Prathamalo. And there he said that if folk is wrong, then maybe the cinema of the world is wrong. So uh, please stop doing it. And he kind of you know, stood beside me and gave me support. And from then on, actually, it became a lot easier for me to find finance for my next films third film, fourth film, whatever. So, because it kind of became easier uh, because of all those supports that I got um, at, a, at a later part. And regarding those international co-productions, I feel like I believe in one thing that, you know, in every film, I, I feel like, okay, first of all, I have to tell the story the way I want to tell. That's one thing. Another thing is, I, I, I always, you know, I feel like I, ca I came from Nakhalpara, which is, which if you, if you draw a circle, it's a small circle. Then I thought, okay, let me keep working. Let me keep, keep working. If we keep working, the circle will keep growing. It will keep growing. So what happened with me is that with all those co-productions, it happened like this, you know. My film started to travel to different festivals. So some people watched those, those films. They became friends of mine. Then they referred these films to some other people. They watched the film. So that's how I started growing frames. And in all my co-productions, India, Germany, wherever it happened, it happened through my, my friends and my growing circle of friends. Yeah, that's how it happened. Right, so I think uh, that's a good point that you bring. Uh, Deepak, if you wanna talk a little bit about how long it took you to make highway, but maybe also build upon 
everyone here, every single director here has had some level of international co-production. So with, with Afia, I think it was um, Nor Norwegian fund called SOR fund that I've uh, mentioned with Paruki and Tashi, it was Germany. Um, Deepak, I think with your second film, it was also uh, Europe and America, if I'm not mistaken. You can talk a little bit about that. And then with Gitu, I believe Liar's Dice was initially supported by a Dutch fund, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So there is some level of international co-production. So given that none of the countries have domestic government support, how are you presenting your film to the international audience, to the international co-producers uh, and getting them excited that they need to be a part of your film? So uh, listening to Gitu and uh, Afia, like uh, going along years of struggle, it seems like mine was fairly easy to start with. <laughs> Then it became difficult. <laughs> so, like Parikhi was saying, it got easier after every film. But for me, like after every film, it's getting more and more complicated. So to begin with, like uh, when I was doing Highway, I didn't know anything like this. All existed anything outside Nepal. I only had wish that I could screen my film somewhere outside, and we all film also travels. But I did not know there was money. There's a festival. There's co-production market. Anything of, of that. But what I had was like, I had a couple of years of journalism practice that had built my relationship. I had built a bit of social capital, but there was always, I was kind of like always an outsider. Like I didn't grow up in Kathmandu. I came from outside. I come from a different community that does not exist in cinema. And uh, so for me, like was, uh, BBC came in between, BBC became a training. I started to work with a filmmaker called Srim Sherpa, who did a film called Mukundo and uh, other two. And uh, I assisted him in film. I quit the journalism in 2004 to assist in his film. And that became a training for me. And then fairly, uh, after a couple of years, I joined BBC. And in 2010, I quit BBC to do my first feature. And what was easier for me was because that I had a doctor couple called Samir Manit Dixit and Lonin Dixit who came with a seed money. Uh, so we could shoot the film. And I gathered my friends and what I also did was like uh, Canon 5D was just being introduced in Nepal. Uh, I think it was not quite available as well. I had a DP friend in Delhi. I asked him to come and help me. So he brought a camera and I had a camera there uh, and we shot with that with like less than $50,000 and we had roughly edited it. Then I got connected with like, I started to uh, write everyone outside for co-production because I needed the money to finish the film and I had no idea how to send the festival and I, need, didn't, I didn't know who to ask for. And that, and luckily I got connected with Jocelyn Vance, Dan, Danny Glover in Liverpool Films in New York with a friend called Mita Hosali, who is a Bengali. But at that time, was, she was living in Kathmandu. She worked at UN. And because that friend connection was the only way, uh, well, way I got connected. And that became a gift for me. Because and then Danny and Justin ran a Kickstarter campaign for us to finish the film because no one would get the grant. We applied a couple of grants. We did not get successful on that. And with uh, a grant, uh, campaign, we raised around $34,000 that helped us finish the film. So our first film was less than $100,000 for everything until Berlin got premiere. And for second, we started working in the beginning. It took around four years. It was also really hard to finance. We was initially thinking about $500,000 a budget but I could only raise like one and a half uh, or close to two for three years. And I decided that I don't want to wait anymore. So I went in 2015 and shot the film. And then we raised a bit of money to finish the film after, and until like last moment when we premiered in Venice, we were looking for money to fly to, ben to go to Venice. So it was- Was your last film a co-production too? Um, yeah, it was, my uh, last 
Wait, Wilson was a good production. Uh, we got Doha as a grant, and we got Hebrew Balls, and we had a couple of grants in the US, like Jerome Foundation, Tribeca. Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay. And that one. And this my uh, next will be a co-production. For that, I have uh, some grants in the US, uh, SFM, and, uh, uh, New York State Council on Arts, and also Hebrew Balls for development but we've been struggling for money for our production though it did right so um, yeah so except except for except for Ruki, it didn't get easier for her for the other filmmakers to make to make movies well, so well, well did it sound that did it sound that it was easier well yeah maybe i'm thinking that it is easier but i know that well i mean every film was a big struggle and after every film is released uh it was a hell for me because once every, one, I mean, any of my film, when it is released back at home, there is always two group and they start fighting with each other on social media. So it's <laughs> like, it's like never easy. Come on. No, I'm just uh, joking. So, I mean, it, it, it does get easier, but it also gets challenging. I mean, I'll give you an example of the film that Faruqi and I are doing, No Land's Man. I met Faruqi on this film six and a half years ago, and he had started working on this even before that. So it's still taken about seven years to, yeah. to shoot this film. So it, it, the work really never stops. Um, and uh, it's it just that as filmmakers, you do have to constantly work on a couple of different projects so that you don't know which one will get traction. That way you at least have something in the works um, as you're working through your different ideas. So Tashi, in, in case of your film, you mentioned that you had a German uh, co-producer on board. Can you talk a little bit about how that came about and uh, what's, what's the next project that you're working on? Yeah, thank you. Um, even I uh, went, uh, my first film went through so much uh, problems and so much uh, bureaucratic hassles and financial problem. When I finished making the film, I told everyone that this is my first and last film. I'm not going to make, <laughs> uh, make films. I'm not going to go there. It's, uh, I'm not going to torture myself. But then again, after one and a half years, I'm here again, <laughs> now working on my next project. Um, I was uh, pretty ignorant about all this thing, what was happening outside uh, in the world, in the independent film, uh, film scene. I didn't know about the, the funding uh, the, the agencies or how to apply for the fund. And uh, uh, luckily, when I was developing the, the, uh, the film, writing the screenplay, Open Doors, uh, uh, Locarno Film Festival had Open Doors and they were looking for, I think, uh, try encouraging filmmakers from this region, uh, South Asia to, to apply. And uh, they had uh, written to me and uh, I find it really funny that uh, they asked me to apply for the Open Doors Fund. And I said, I don't want to apply. I said, I'm going to make the film this year. And though I didn't have a single pie in my, uh, in the thing, I, I, I have no co-producers. I have no one, I don't have money. I don't, I don't have a single pie, but I don't know what was going in my mind. I told them that I'm not going to apply for the fund because I'm going to make the film this year. I said, if I apply, then I have to wait for one more year. And I even asked them that if I win an award, will you fast track the, the cash and would you give me early? And they said, yeah, fine. They said, they'll do that. I was like, I, because I, was, I didn't know what was happening. I had no idea. And uh, the only thing I knew was I, want, I wanted to make the firm. And then I applied, then I, they selected, I won the production grant uh, at the, the Open Doors. And that's where I met uh, the German uh, producer. And she, was, uh, she wanted to, to uh, work with me. She wanted to invest in the film. And then I met uh, Ram Krishna also at the, at the Open Doors. And uh, then I, I just uh, went ahead uh, with whatever I had, though I didn't have money. And in between, I had to ask for a loan and then uh, I didn't pay a lot of people still. So <laughs> this, <laughs> this, this is how, how I made the film. And then, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, somebody asked me uh, how, I mean, I, I, I really didn't enjoy making the film. 
in terms of uh, the the I mean the, the the physical the effort you had to give and then then the, the financial side it was it was a really it was a it was a torture but i guess i have uh, i don't know what else to do so i'm i'm still still again trying to make a film <laughs> yeah so i think that's very interesting that, that tashi you mentioned that as well cuz afia mentioned that very early on is that as a filmmaker as a director you do need to know the business side of things and and I, I i think that's very important too it's not necessary that you need to know all the intricate details of deal making and structuring but understanding how uh, uh, the business side of things work how the financing and the funding and marketing and distribution would work i think is a pretty important thing for for filmmakers all of you have made films that have traveled internationally uh, and in some cases they might have done better internationally than in your home countries so as you are writing as you are developing your materials how do you uh, do you keep the audience in mind do you think who is going to watch this film or are you in the service of the story and you you think the audience will come maybe we'll start with geetu and the afia and the nafia no I, i for me i can never think about who i'm catering to when i'm writing or when, i don't i i don't think i'll be fair to myself if i'm doing that and i think if i'm doing that i'll be completely um not being honest to how i want to tell my story but i do realize i mean i was seeing a pattern how liars dies came about and um and a, like how uh, farooqi was saying there's a section of people who says this and a section of people who says that i was a first time filmmaker and i did a film and they were thinking who is this girl from the southernmost tip of india first <laughs> film and it got into the nation century like who is she like you know there were like talks like that <laughs> and and i was it, it, it was amazing like for me i was just sitting there because this is not something which i bargain for and i'm telling you it was like inheriting a white elephant because it's hard enough that seven years we struggled to gain financing uh, in order to make the film and now we have to go fight the oscars and <laughs> and, and what am i supposed to do for that so it's amazing i mean it's really hilarious i think i should do a film on how you know that process happened because mm-hmm. it was exciting you know we with buckets you're thinking that okay the government is going to help and nobody is there to help us you're getting oh you're going to get free tickets for you know to take the team there and the, nothing happens it's just you and the struggle starts so it's literally like inheriting a white elephant i don't know what the hell i'm supposed to do i'm lucky that i had a rich relative <laughs> who pitched in and helped me mm-hmm. and now this time uh, uh, you know every time that i'm thinking okay okay now we you know for the submission and this and that i'm thinking if i win the oscar i'll sell my house why would i want to do that like i was literally there i mean i don't know for half yeah you remember we were mm-hmm. we were you know we were in la and we we're doing i had no house to sell <laughs> <laughs> i had a loan on a house and i couldn't sell it So I'm then LA and they think yeah you can throw parties I said parties we can bring samosa from home what parties are you talking about <laughs> so it was amazing how we all sat there and then we had all these people coming in for the show and they see so it was all a new experience for me you know it was it was all I'm sorry I'm rambling what what was your question I should be very <laughs> <laughs> No it's okay I mean this the the question was about if you're thinking about an audience but oh, I, no. i no. think you're getting to the point yeah i'm getting to the point because for me and and after that when i did uh, muton um which premiered at uh, toronto and there were you know people again um saying people calling me and saying oh this doesn't feel like it's directed by a woman and i'm thinking mm-hmm. wow is there a <laughs> is there something that you look at a film and it's you know you can make out if it's directed by a woman or a man like it's crazy like how such opinions come and after that journey uh, when i'm writing something i'm not looking at if i'm going to be selling indian exotica or if i'm staying to like i'm not going i'm not catering for the people uh, in toronto or the oscars or even the people here i'm not i'm going to tell my story the way i want to tell it and if it's going to be paced in a speed which i decide you sit back and you relax and you watch it if you don't want to watch it don't buy the ticket it's as simple as that <laughs> you know but i'm not going to uh, change uh, my speed or the way i want to tell it uh, 
to cater to anybody. Like I'm very clear with that. And having said that, uh, I hope I, you know, um, have this in my heart all the time because I'm going to be doing a big film next. And even with the big film, I kept telling the producer that I don't, it, it's a gangster film. And I, and I told him it's a female gays gangster film. And I don't think, don't think it's going to be smoking barrels in slow motion and it's smoke coming <laughs> in and he's walking. No, <laughs> he's not going to be doing any of that. So he's like, no, no, you make your film. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll show you what I can make. But so I'm not even worried about all the money which is coming in and how I'm going to put it out there. But I think I, I hope I don't sell my soul. I mean, that's all I'm going to say because now I'm saying this, but and, and I hope I don't get into any pressures and pressures of any sort in the terms of, you know, being stars, being there or whatever there. I hope I'm just very true and honest to the way I want to tell it. And that is, um, I, I think that's my uh, honesty for myself, for my work. So, yeah. Um, I, mean, I, I, I agree with, you know, just jumping off that. I think it's so important to, uh, to not give in to the idea of who is my audience in your first draft. Like when you're starting to explore something, it's super important to just write the story and figure out, you know, what do you want out of it? Because I mean, at the heart of any good film or any good story, there's something very universal, right? So at the end of the day, if you can tap into that um, consciously or unconsciously, that's, you know, that, that really is, is what it is. Audiences will find a way to connect with it. You just make the damn thing, right? And that's that's what I believe in it. And this is something that um, Sri and I learned, you know, through our experience in terms of distributing Dukhtar. Uh, once the film was made, we premiered at Toronto, uh, and we were told that as soon as Dukhtar was, you know, the ticket for Dukhtar was up on Toronto's website, within one hour, all our tickets were gone for that world premiere. There was such a huge demand for it that the programmers were like, what's happening here, you know? And, and all our screenings were sold out, completely sold out. And we had long lines outside of the festival, you know, for people waiting to, to get in. So it was really gratifying to see that something that you thought was the small local story in your own country has this universal appeal for global audiences. And, and that was really like eye-opening for all of us um, on that film. Uh, right after our world premiere, we also became Pakistan's official submission for the Oscars. And like Geetu, we were scrambling to like figure out like how do we deal with this, right? Because we have film critics who are now gonna review this film. We have people, we have to take out ads. We have to run a campaign. Like that's a whole set of skills that I don't have, but you have to learn how to like understand that part of, of, uh, of playing, um, playing the game, so to speak, once your film is made. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a really important lesson in how uh, you can continue to go after audiences or are them actually finding you and then you kind of sustaining that interest, uh, which is the distribution side. Um, and throughout our distribution, we found audiences where we thought would never, you know, our film would never play. Like Japan bought the rights to Dukhtar. I was like, wow, I never thought that the Japanese audience would want to see this film. But there is a huge audience there for, for these kinds of stories and, and uh, a perspective, right? I think global audiences are hungry for the untold perspective, like right here in this room, the perspective from all our, you know, these filmmakers here, from all these different countries, I think it's a very enriching thing. And we have audiences all over. So I don't think our first draft should ever worry about that. You know, that's something for later when you, when you go out in the world and pitch your story. I mean, I have crazy stories to tell of what happened when I was pitching this in Hollywood. Uh, this indie film, when I was first trying to find the money and I was like, yeah, studios would love this film. It's a thriller, it's a road trip uh, and, and so on. And, and I remember this one meeting where uh, this guy asked me, you know, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a role of a truck driver in the film. He's gonna help the mother and child. And he asked me, you know, what if you make this film in English and um, this truck driver was Tom Cruise? We could get this funded. And I was like, no, that is not the film I'm trying to make, right? So, so 
in terms of i i knew my audience in that respect this is not the audience i want you know i i want to stay stay authentic and fighting for the authenticity um is the most important thing for me uh, and so i will fight to continue to preserve that outlook rather than just give in i'm not just going to give in because of financial says hey here's the money and you know let's let's do it like this if it if it's going to take away from the story if it's going to take away from its authenticity i don't think that could work for me and so mm-hmm. that part of the battle is like the harder one to kind of navigate i think right so faruki thank you afi and gitu faruki uh how challenging was it for you to going from your first film to your second film and then every subsequent film after that to creatively stay motivated and I'll ask that question to the rest of you as well in terms of the material that you're working on um and keeping again like keeping the audience in mind or not keeping the audience in mind I know a few of your films have also been Bangladeshi's entries for the Oscars uh so can you talk a little bit about sort of the creative challenges that you face as you went from film to film well i mean it is interconnected i think the creative challenge and at the same time who who are you making the film for um well the the biggest challenge i find is the challenge of censorship and this is this is strange uh sort of situation here like i mean i made about seven films and i think six of my films had to suffer at the censor board some films for four months some suffered for two years some is still banned so i mean i think for me this this idea of censoring is the biggest challenge i always faced it's not only i mean this challenge did not only come from the censor board but, but also from society as well uh so that is the that is the biggest challenge because i remember you know i made one film in 2010 uh, 9 third person singular so when it was released back at home i went to the theater to see audience's reaction so i was coming out uh, of the theater and i was in the lift uh, so there were many people so it was just quiet and all of a sudden i realized that one uh, woman who is about 45 to 50 years old she was uh, telling uh, her um, i don't know daughter or uh, niece i don't know what she was telling her that this this man this uh, imbecile made this film this is such a bad guy because they thought that you know in this in that film i showed so many things which is uh, i mean which doesn't go with our society which doesn't go with our norms so in that same lift i was like oh my god i i, I was acting like i was not hearing anything mm-hmm. so so this is a sort of thing i i went through but at the same time i have to tell that i got huge laugh from bangladeshi audience as well so this is also true if i don't say this then i only, i'm only saying the one part of it now regarding this um uh who i make this film for i want to tell you one example which i wrote a few days ago on my instagram me and tisha were coming back from our studio it was one in the morning so no one is, was there in the road so there was a pharmacy where we went to you know buy some drugs medicine so we stopped the car and we went out of the car and we found that there was a old man about 70 to 75 years old he was playing flute and there was absolutely no audience no one and there, there's no chance of any audience coming because it's around 1 am and he was you know his eyes were closed he was playing with all his passion so tisha went inside uh, to buy the medicine i was standing in front of him i was first listening then i started doing video i re- started recording it and once he finished it i said uh, uncle so um, why who are you playing for i mean does anybody come and pay you some money and then he was saying no no i mean who would come at this time i play for myself i think most of the artists they play for they are like that old man they play for themselves you know maybe they have some pain in their heart so they play the flute to you know get rid of this pain so maybe you all make films or paint um paint a painting or you know make a song just just to get relieved of the pain that we have in our heart uh, that pain may become from joy maybe come from some frustration that it may it can come from some anger whatever but that's a sort of pain 
and we make films or we make art to get release, get relieved of this pain. But then again, then I was asking myself, do I, do I really keep any audience in mind? I don't know, maybe I keep a, because you know, film is about communication as well. Maybe I keep a imaginary audience who I don't know, maybe that audience is myself. Maybe I ask myself, oh, does it communicate? So I am the maker and I became a, uh, the audience again. So I have, you know, kind of two entity. And then I, I ask my audience entity, oh, does it communicate? Does it make sense? If it, if to that entity, if it makes sense, then he says that, oh, yeah, it makes sense, go ahead. Then I said, go ahead. So maybe this sort of thing uh, worked, but no, I, I'm sure none of us um, change the way we want to tell a story just because audience want to see it some other way. No, I don't think that I uh, change it or any of us change it. No. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, uh, thank you, Farooqui. Uh, Deepak and, and Tashi, um, given that both your countries have, have pretty nascent, pretty early new film industries in that sense, how are you positioning your film in the marketplace? Let's say you've premiered your film how are you differentiating um, the film for, uh, in Tashi, in your case, that it is a Bhutanese film and Deepak in your case, uh, that it is a Nepali film in the audience so that it is not overshadowed by Indian cinema? And, and do you often, do you on uh, your films often get just clubbed into uh, Indian film, for instance? And, and what is the conversation you are having with the international programmers and international co-producers or financiers or journalists to keep that identity. I think I mentioned that earlier, how to keep the Bhutanese identity and how to keep the Nepali identity. So maybe Tashi will start with you and then with Deepak. Um, I don't know whether I do that uh, consciously, but uh, since uh, I sort of write the story which I feel that I want to write, I think it's a kind of uh, uh, automatic that it, it, it is a Bhutanese uh, story. And uh, I don't do it uh, consciously, but I guess subconsciously uh, in, in my case, I feel that uh, most probably the, the use of uh, the, 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 the Buddhist philosophy I'm not a, I mean, like, I, I'm not a very, I'm not uh, uh, religious, but I call myself uh, a Buddhist. So the use of, because my uh, mom is a very uh, a religious uh, a Buddhist uh, uh, person. So I have been influenced by my mother. And uh, so I, I don't know, but I feel that uh, there's this, uh, this, uh, uh, kind of a, a Buddhist philosophy that comes to my story, but I guess that might uh, might be the the identity that is which I feel that must be Bhutanese. I, I I'm not sure, but I don't do it consciously to create an identity and to create that uh, a, a film that is uh, uniquely Bhutanese to the outside world. I don't do it consciously, but I uh, write a story which I feel that. Uh, that uh, resonates with me and uh, which makes sense to me, not necessarily with uh, someone else or with the audience. Even if I'm asked to write a, write a story or make a film uh, for a particular audience, I don't think I'll be able to write because I really don't know. I write what I know. Mm -hmm. that's, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, that's one of the, the first sort of film school or, or screenwriting advice that you get is start with writing what you know and then keep building on top of that. So Deepak, to follow up on the earlier question, if you can answer that, but also tell us a little bit about how you find your material or the, the kind of story that you wanna tell. Uh, I will just, uh, it's sort of like what Tassi mentioned uh, I think uh, for me also, like I started making film because of this pr being frustrated and uh, trying to express myself. So I never thought about like who would really watch it and if I would be able to sell it or not sell it. Uh, like, uh, because even like my route was not uh, financing uh, outside. So that didn't start it that way. And still now 
for me, it's not this will sell better. So make, let's make that one. I think that's a, a different kind of I think idea of thinking about the cinema, like what uh, is a commercial commodity, like like the Hollywood does. Yeah, Bollywood maybe do. Most of us, I think, we want to express ourselves in the film, and we want to question about what we don't like or what we find troubling in our society. So uh, that has not been my part of like thinking as well. Like it's always rooted to me. And I, I believe in personal cinema. I believe in uh, cinema that what I experienced through, and again, like coming through the question of identity, I haven't struggled on that. Because uh, I do like, uh, besides uh, making like financing the film, uh, managerial, like we, uh, everyone talked about earlier, managing the film and shooting the film is another challenge finding your team and then going and shooting it uh, is uh, another challenge, like being from an outsider, being from a different ethnicity, when you're starting a hiring a crew, the, the questions, person that we don't know, first thing they want to know if I'm an Indian coming to Nepal to making a film, like when did I come, and where, where I coming from? So that identity that uh, always being asked, either it's an actor or the crew that I don't know personally. So it's always, I'm being explained anyway in the process. So for me, like finding the true Nepali identity, it is also very complicated because our, we are the country where 123 languages is still spoken and we have several different ethnicity. What is the really true Nepali identity? I don't know. For me is what I am that should be Nepali or like where mm -hmm. I grew up, like what I can bring in is uh, that's, the identity that I can bring into the cinema. So I don't look for outside. It's uh, like whatever I, I'm coming from. And then also it gets transformed, right? Like once we start shooting, we start working with actor, actor starts bringing their real life experiences as well. Like I improvise with actor. I don't uh, give them a particular dialogue. Like I write the dialogues, but I don't uh, ask them to re read the exact line. I start working with the same actors separately and developing the character and uh, dialogue. So they bring their identities into the cinema, their, their experience in cinema. So it gets starts from, from coming from me and my co-writer, then expanding it to the actor and like going through that process. So I believe that's kind of like the key is the identity and like outside, yeah, it's been sometimes it's weird to screen at an Indian film festival because Indian film festival expanding themselves to be a South Asian, but not, they never changed the name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> I second so, Deepak. <laughs> so it's, it's difficult, like it's, it gets muddled up there. And back home in Nepal, like uh, always it's releasing is complicated because our all cinemas are captured by big Bollywood films. So we get window around one week or two weeks between somewhere sometime. But again, like if American is releasing a film or Salman is releasing a film, we don't get theater. There is no other way to release a film. So you hardly right. uh, come for a week or two, you get in between and you get to release it. And after that, there is no other way to reach out to audience. We don't have cinematic, we don't have museum. Our university doesn't screen. Like I beg schools and universities for uh, uh, screen the film. You can't expect them to pay, but even like uh, asking them to screen is a begging, like going through all process. So you spend four or five years making a film and then you start begging people to screen your film. It's another hassle. So I haven't been so good at uh, reaching out to the audience after that and releasing the films. And so it's a lot of complaint from Nepal that once the film is gone, there's no way to watch it. And that's been a difficult right. thing. So I, um, Deepak, sorry, yeah, Tashi, go ahead. I always say that uh, because of the, the, the huge presence of Bollywood, uh, I always say that we, we picked up a, a broken piece of mirror from the Bollywood's vanity bag. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very difficult to come out of uh, the Bollywood the, yeah. the cloud. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's interesting that both of you sort of mentioned that because it's, the situation in India is actually no different. Indian independent cinema is at the same mercy of Bollywood that that you guys are. Even uh, even Indian independent films, the possibility of getting a screen, a, th a theatrical release, is extremely limited. Uh, given there are so many different film industries in India, 
and the commercial or mainstream cinema really dominates the theaters and theaters give slots like 9 a.m. or 11.50 p.m. to independent films when really like an audience who really wants to see the film, they are the ones who are gonna come. But it's very hard for the mainstream audience to discover an independent film because they don't play them at cinemas. And it's it's a challenge that I think is across the continent where, where Bollywood uh, really dominates uh, the marketplace. I think Deepak, you mentioned a little bit about your process of, of how you approach a scene and directing. Afi, I would like to ask you that question as a director. So what is your, I'll ask this question to all of you. Let's say you're getting ready to do your film. You've, you're directing your first scene for this new film. How do you approach that scene? And, and how do you get to directing? In a, let, tell us in a, a short nugget. Otherwise I know we can go on a very long conversation, <laughs> but I just wanna know how you approach a scene. Well, for me, there's a lot of different things going on in a scene. It's, um, it's about what is that one thing that I want from it? Like that's like the overarching thing, you know, um, in terms of what's happening, in terms of dynamic, what do I want to, what note do I want to hit at the end of the scene? Then the location, like the, just the visual aspect of a location, uh, for me, in my films, that's always a big character. So how I use the space whether it's interior space or whether it's an outdoor exterior location, I'm always looking for ways to uh, say something about the inner landscape of the character with respect to the landscape in the, you know, around me. So how do I capture that? Um, but really it's about being able to be very clear about what is it that you want from it and, and kind of, framing it in such a way that the subtext is always there. Um, and that for me is part of just my visual approach to it. Um, and, and because we're filming out of sequence and you know there's, there's all kinds of stuff falling apart on the set. So it's also a matter of, you know, of a director being kind of shutting everything else out <laughs> and focusing on what's happening here in front of your eyes, because that's the thing that's gonna now be immortal in the edit. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm always, and for me, the influences change. Like, you know, Dukhtar was a road trip. So we were doing exterior filming for two months. I was out on the road in deep midwinter with my crew. So the light would change, the weather would change. There would be a landslide and you know, that has to be now part of the story somehow. Like how do you navigate the changing reality on the set and still, uh, staying true to what needs to be done. Uh, so it's a, it's always a complex navigation of what the day might bring for you and, and adapting right. to that. Yeah. Right, so for Faruqi, uh, how, how do you approach a scene, your first scene on a film? And for you, has it changed over the course of your different films? Has that approach changed as you went on to make more films? I was listening to Afia and I was, I was getting lost. I was thinking about my my first day of shooting. I think my first day, as you know, that I, I improvise a lot. I mean, my script is never written. My script is probably written on the on the on the shooting location on the spot. So for me, first day of shooting is is always. Uh, if I can give you one example, it's like if you can think of a huge mountain, and I'm with a small like a shop, and I'm trying to you know, carve out. The character is, is I, I mean, it's, it's like a big struggle to find the character, to catch the character, to catch his, his mood, his tone, and not only catching the character's tone, but also probably catching the primary note of the film, primary tone of the film. How do I catch it? So what happened is in most of my cases, till now, I, I saw that, and, and uh, you saw it with Nolan's Man as well. Uh, in most of my films, I saw that my first days or second days of shooting, they hardly find any place in the final edit. So, I mean, I mean, for me, it's like, if you think about painting, you, you, I mean, the first layer is like some, some random blue brush. And while you are, you know, painting blue, you're thinking of actually what color you want. Maybe in the final, final painting, you see that it's all yellow. So, so first day is like that first coat of painting, which is, which is always, you know, playing with darkness. Gita, how do you approach 
approach to film. And so your first film was in Himachali and Hindi and your second film's in, in Malayalam. And has that sort of approach changed because of the kind of film that you were making? Firstly, I just want to warn everybody that any minute there can be a beagle coming out of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> because it ate everything. It peed on my bed and it's running around like a crazy dog. <laughs> right there. <laughs> right there. <laughs> Anyway, this morning. Um, so yeah, no, my approach, see for me, um, I think I'm still discovering myself. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say this is my style, this is not, but I, I realize, a, I'll tell you a pattern which is happening. And that is that the, thematically in all my films, there seems to be a search. And I think that is exactly how I uh, continue even on set. Um, you know, because it, with my first film, it's about uh, the woman searching um, for a missing husband. And in the second, it's a little um, child searching for uh, the older brother. And the next film is also a search. So I'm thinking, what am I searching for? You know, that's my main question, which a lot of people keep asking me. But I feel what I do, and just like how Faruqi said, the first couple of days never make it to the edit. And for me, <laughs> and that's also a pattern, which is very, you know, it's, it's quite similar. And, and I think what I do is, um, it, it's kind of like what I write, I don't shoot. What I shoot, I don't edit. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> so it's, it keeps evolving. And you know, there are actors who are like, oh, this is it, I'm doing the pivotal role, but they just realize they're like nowhere <laughs> in the film. <laughs> <laughs> and the film when it's over because you know if I find someone exciting while I'm filming and there is a magic that happens that I just go with that magic I go with that impulse and that character develops that space develops and then I move on so I like that kind of a journey as well it's because that's the reason why we're not writing for any audience because we are enjoying the process of filmmaking we're enjoying the process of making that cinema so I'm very selfish that way. So I, so for me, it's kind of crazy. Like I have co-writers right now who are saying, we can't work with you anymore. And they're like falling off. The band back. <laughs> I keep, you know, ripping my script. I say, this is bad. I'm going to restart. And I keep doing this. So I, I don't know what my process is, but I know that I'm, uh, I'm not uh, somebody uh, who's very reliable <laughs> for anyone, you know, because I keep changing. Like I keep changing. I keep changing my thoughts. I keep changing my attitude for what, and, and finally, when we are all there after the couple of days, you know, once we all, the dust settles and we're settling in and I feel that everybody's soaked in, you know, taking in the scene and everything, then I move in consistently with how I want to tell it, the leaner narrative. Mm -hmm. Slowly, I ease people in, we slowly, and then once there's a hand in glove with all the uh, HODs and me all coming together, then magic happens. Then it's a trip. Mm -hmm. You know, you leave the actors, like how Deepak says, my process is very similar. I just say, this is the dialogue, this is the space, go freak out. And then I sort of move in with that. So I think in some way, I think all of us are pretty much saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. also. I think, so I think I, I have to move on to the audience questions. So my first question is, is for all of you, how long do you sit on an idea? Once you have an idea, let's say, as you're either having lunch or in the middle of the night, how long do you sit on it and how do you continue to develop this idea into what might end up being a film? So maybe we'll start with, uh, with Deepak and then Tashi and then Afia. I don't think there's a mathematics for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't really know. Like uh, sometimes like you feel like immediately noted down something. Sometimes uh, I always find difficult noting, uh, writing in paper expressing myself. Mm. So sometimes it's a lot of time like just thinking about it and then seeing like how I can convey and like at least making notes. I do most times like not write in computer. Like sometimes I have a diary and I start writing in the diary like what ideas I have. And then uh, seeing next day or once I sit to write the script then start writing uh, pen, pen and paper. So I don't know exactly it to answer your question, but uh, I started with diary. Right. So, I mean, I guess a, a follow-up question is, how do you re-energize yourself after you've had the idea and, and, and you wrote it down in your diary and you developed it a little bit, but nothing has happened in a year on this, or you moved on to something else. How do you get yourself excited about something that you thought of like a year ago or six months ago? Like what is, 
What is that self-motivation process for you? Uh, deadline to deadline. <laughs> <laughs> preparing a draft for Berlin and then preparing another draft for cinema or preparing another draft for short fund or, or for a producer or for a market or for something. Mm. Like keeping a deadline for yourself, like, because I know it, I want to make that film. I have a reason to do it and do it. And I think I would make any way. Uh, like if I can't find a million, if I find a few uh, hundred thousand, someday like I would go and shoot in some way. But finding that right time, until that there is a right time, I keep approaching people. I keep approaching like uh, grants or I keep, keep approaching everything. So the deadlines helps. Uh, to define, mm. I keep keep going. Great, Tashi. Uh, yeah, like Deepak said, it's it's uh it's uh, difficult to answer, in the sense that uh, you you have an idea and then after maybe a few days or after maybe sometimes after a month that idea doesn't make sense to you, and then you discard that and then you jump on to another one. So it it, it really depends. But uh, I feel that, uh, but when you have a, a, a idea, uh, if, if it stays with you for some time, uh, when you keep thinking about it, and if it stays with you for maybe a few months and then a year, then you, I, I feel that there's something in there. Though I have not come out with a narrative or a story, but uh, usually I come, uh, come out with a question, like uh, Gitu said about, like a search, or uh, I ask a question to myself, which is the, 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 the basis of the, the, uh, the, the narrative. So when that question stays with me for some time, maybe one, two months or maybe a year, then I feel that there's something in there and then I tend to, tend to uh, dig uh, deeper. So yeah, the, the, the film that I'm developing right now, that I'm writing right now has been with me for the last uh, 10 years. So I've been thinking about the story and I've been keeping notes. So sometimes uh, things uh, take a while and sometimes it, it doesn't, yeah. Okay, Afia? So it's a, it's a hard question, right? Uh, for me, I'm, I'm working on several things as a writer. There's one job that I've been hired to write, so I'm doing that. Then there's one thing that I wanna do on my own, which is a TV show, so I'm doing that. And then there's a feature film that I wanna make. So I'm doing that. So how does one kind of like navigate uh, that? And I think giving yourself deadlines or carving your own time. I, I make my Fridays or if I can, my Sundays are usually my writing days once a week. And so whatever I need to work on, I make it that that is my day that I'm just going to claim that and I'm going to do whatever, even if I'm just staring at the screen and writing one line <laughs> or word, that's what I'm going to do. Um, but coming back to the larger question, you know, like which of these ideas then do you want to run with? I think that's important. Like you want to figure out like what is that thing that's, and I, and I look for the thing that's going to just grab me and something that I might lose my sleep over because I'm obsessing about that one. That's the idea I run with. So what I'm doing is, look, if you look here, I keep this diary like Deepak does. I've just scribbled notes yesterday on on one of the, um, there's a sci-fi sci idea I'm developing and I'm like, okay, this is going to be my next film and I'm just going to give it my all. So I'm just spending my energies uh, researching parts of that and there's visuals. Like for me, I love collecting visuals, um, moments, music uh, that inform that world and, and that starts helping me grow the idea. So mm -hmm. I would suggest finding that thing that's really driving you, pick something. And, and focus your energies on that and, and run with that one because it takes a long time. You know, if you're uh, like, you know, everyone here has several things that they're developing, but what is that one thing you want to pick out of that bunch and go with? I think it's important to get into that. Great, thank you. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, what are some resources where you can find grants you can apply for and any tips on how to go about it? Uh, I would really quickly answer this question uh, for filmmakers in South Asia primarily there are a few major funds uh, out of Europe that support independent filmmaking in South Asia there's uh, the Hubert Balz fund from Netherlands there is the World Cinema Fund from Berlin the Cinemas du Monde from France 
there is SOAR Fund from Norway, uh, there's Locarno Open Doors, um, and there are numerous other European funds. I would r highly recommend looking at this website called olfi.com, uh, which has a list of funding available uh, throughout the world. And uh, check that out and you can input your country and find out what funds might be available for you. Um, another question, all of you have attended markets. Um, very quickly, how should a first time filmmaker, first time feature filmmaker, if they have the opportunity to attend a film market, how should they present themselves? And what is a turn off for the international industry uh, from your perspective? Like what turns someone off about your project and about uh, how pushy you might be on, on, on your film? So what, what is a tip you can give a first time filmmaker that, that is attending an international film market? Uh, maybe Faruqi will start with you and then Gitu and, and, and Deepak. Wish I knew. <laughs> I'm, I'm still learning and I still don't know what works with. Well, I mean, one piece of advice is people are different. Uh, whoever you are preaching to, remember that he is a new person. Um, I mean, it's, it's like, it's not like paracetamol. Like, you cannot use same medicine for everyone. Yeah. When you start talking to someone, uh, try to communicate with him, look at his eyes and try to see his interest. And then maybe you'll know how to communicate with him. It's, I mean, pitching is a kind of, it's purely an art of communication. And, and I, don't, I, I really don't have any um, definitive advice for like, okay, that's, that's the way you, sh you should pitch it. But one thing I can tell that, you know, get ready for improvise. I mean, you know, to, to me, a pitching market is, is, a, is a very interesting place because I have always done this myself. Uh, every time I pitch it to someone, I, I, I try to discover the loopholes of the story. And I try to instantly, you know, you know fix those loopholes. So it's a kind of my, my way of going about it. Like, if needed, get ready for improvisation. Yeah, I think that's a, I mean, that's a good point that you bring up. I mean, one thing I would highly recommend is having uh, pitches ready for your film at different lengths. 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, five minutes. So depending on the interest level of the person that you're speaking to, you should be able to modify your pitch as you are, are having this conversation. One thing I must say though, avoid pitching at parties. People are there to have a good time, meet you as a filmmaker, meet you as a human being. They're not there to listen to your story. Um, and I think it's very important that in parties when you're, when you're pitching, uh, think that it can be a 30 second or a one minute pitch just so that you can get the person interested and have talk about life, talk about your tastes and likes and dislikes about movies you love. Really audio, in, at a market, at a party, at the end of every day, once everyone has sat and had meetings for six to eight hours, they don't want to listen to a pitch. So just something to keep in mind. It's a, a very common mistake a lot of first time filmmakers make is that they go into pitching about their project after an eight hour day and the person is just turned off. I mean, I myself, when I've been at markets, I do get turned off at the end of a eight hour day when someone is trying to pitch me their magnum opus. The script might be good, but I just don't want to listen to it right now. I listen to it tomorrow morning, you know? Uh, Gitu, any, any tips that you might have? Yeah, I have a very different take about this whole market and pitching. Um, I, I like it, it's, um, it's engaging, it's interactive. Uh, if it works, it works, great. Um, but I feel that, especially the new filmmakers, the, the budding filmmakers, when you're part of the market, see who you're speaking to. You know, you, you need to understand, do your homework. Who are you pitching to? You have to size them up. Don't let them size you up. You have your content, you have your stuff, you know what you wanna make. And you say it confidently and that's about it. But see if you're wasting time and who are you talking to? Who are you pitching to? Because there's so many people that are going to meet in the market and they're going to be maybe three out of that so many who actually matters who, or, or who are actually the players who actually can turn things. You know, there are so many times that I've been to markets where it's not the right representatives who even come. It's like their assistants, assistants who come because they're having a fancy holiday in India. So I do a lot of homework and I make sure that I'm speaking to the right people. If not, I'm not wasting my time. So I think that's something which all everyone should, you know, like do their homework on. And my dog is literally 
eating my bed. So. <laughs> Okay, I think we're going we're gonna to wrap up uh, in, in a minute. The website that I mentioned earlier was olffi.com that lists all the international funding. So please check it out. Um, so as we're wrapping up the conversation, I just want all of you to quickly answer two things. One is, where can we watch your films um, if they're available and which one? And the other thing is, what's the last film that you saw that you really love and what should what would you recommend to the audience so we'll start with uh with afia then deepak tashi faruki and geet so doctor is available on netflix if you have access to it go watch it um and i'm actually into tv shows nowadays more than feature films to be honest but the last feature film that I saw that blew me away was Parasite. I mean, man, that film, it just turned my head inside out in terms of story, character, and how it turns the world upside down. And, and it's so surprising. So I just love that. And, and I wish more, you know, anyone who hasn't seen it as yet to just go watch it. Great, Deepak? Uh, sadly, uh, I don't have like options to watching in uh, South Asia right now. Like my any of my films is not online in South Asia. So, but it's uh, if they can uh, anyone you can use VPN, <laughs> access the Amazon Prime in the US or iTunes outside. It's available uh, in different countries, but I'm still struggling to find a way to screen in South Asia. The film that I love, like uh, Parasite, of course, and also I liked a lot was uh, La Miserable. Uh, the French uh, film from 2019 is a police thriller with explosive uh, arrests and uh, police dynamics in, uh, set in Paris. Also loved Atlantic of Madrid. Great. Tashi? Um, I'm sorry that uh, my film is not uh, in any platform right now and uh, hasn't been sold anywhere. <laughs> and uh, the last film that I watched, uh, the last film that I liked was, I think it's a uh, quote by the Indian filmmaker, Chatanya Tamhani. Yeah, I watched maybe a few months back and uh, uh, I still remember that film. And uh, it was a lovely film. Thank you. Uh, so Tashi, uh, since you mentioned your film's not available, is there a, a good SVOD or streaming platform to watch Bhutanese films that might have a, a few different Bhutanese films that you can think of at the top of your head? Well, it's the it's not there, but recently I uh, uh, another filmmaker, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Dichin Roder, she had started a, a video on demand VOD platform where uh, there's a collection of uh, Bhutanese uh, films there. It's called uh, bioscope.com or something Bioscope. like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, Ch Chaitanya Tamane has a new film out as well, uh, The Disciple. The Disciple, uh, yeah. Mm. Just started um, uh, his journey at the Venice Film Festival and won a couple of awards there. So I'm looking forward to seeing that one. Uh, Faruqi, uh, where can people watch some of your films? And uh, what's the film that you saw that you would recommend? Uh, well, I, well, I don't know whether people can watch it. My films, television, and end story, those are in, uh, where on Netflix right now it's not because our license licensing period is over. Right now it is available on a South Asian platform called Hoi Choi. I don't know if people can access it or not. So if anyone has Hoi Choi, they can watch television and end story on Hoi Choi. And as for the Last film that I saw in Mo was moved. Actually, I, I need to mention two films, two very different kind of films. Uh, one is obviously Parasite, and the other one is Portrait of Lady on, uh, Portrait of a Lady on Fire. So both are very opposite kind of different kind of film, and I was really really moved by both the films. Amazing films. Thank you, Kitu. Okay, so. Uh... Muton is on Z, uh, Z5, and Liar's Dice is on Netflix. And I'm embarrassed about the last movie I saw, so I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something which just came out and 
the series and who hard i saw it and i'm like Ugh. so i hate it so i'm not going to say it but i'm reading uh, pamuk's red my name is red so that's exciting that's a which i want to share Okay. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for an exciting conversation and a, and a good panel. Um, to our audience out there, please uh, follow all of these filmmakers on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, you can just search their names, and you will be able to find find their handles. I think it's very important for uh, South Asian filmmakers and audiences to boost uh, South Asian filmmakers. So I would really recommend. Uh, following them and and promoting their work um, as you can. Um, Diff has some exciting uh, panels left. Uh, I will be moderating a panel uh, about decoding international funding on November 2nd at 6.30 p.m. Indian time. Um, you can join through the website and there are some really lovely films that are available worldwide um, through the Diff platform that you can watch. So I would highly recommend uh, and encourage you to discover some new independent voices coming out of South Asia. Thank you for your time. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you everyone. Yeah, everyone. Thank, you. thank you, everyone, yeah. Thank you. Let's all stay in touch. Yeah, please. Sure, yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thanks, Shri and Dave. Thank you.